Hey, beautiful ones. How are you this evening? Thank you so much for tuning into the latest edition of the Business of Black Beauty. I am your host, Stefanetta Isis Harmon, and I am so honored tonight to continue our conversations around Black women and men who are creating their own seats and tables in the beauty industry. And tonight we are talking with marketing guru, Will Shelton, who is the CEO and founder of Will Power Integrated Marketing. He has built his brand over the past 25 plus years, helping black owned salons and barbershops tap into their full marketing potential. Hey, Will, how are you tonight? Hey, I'm doing great. <laughs> great and grateful. I'm happy to be here and thank you for having me on. Thank you. Thank you. I'm so excited. I, um, you know, came across some of your work uh, on LinkedIn and across the webs, the interwebs in terms of uh, what are people doing in the business of black beauty and your name popped up over and over again. So I want to, I had to know more about you. So can you give us um, just an inside tip, take on who you are and what you do? Yeah, um, definitely kind of a unique story. My name is Will Shelton, I'm the CEO of Willpower Integrated Marketing. Um, my company helps global brands and entertainment companies connect with the African-American consumer in barbershops and black salons across the nation. So the story, it started like this though. I actually am a licensed cosmetologist and barber for the last 27 years. Oh, wow. And yeah, and you know, I, I owned my own salon for 10 years. So in having my own shop, you know, clients come in, they're there for a couple of hours, I'm doing their hair work, you know, and it's always like a conveyor belt of conversations. It's so personal. You know, your stylist can get more out of you in 15 minutes than a therapist in 15 years. Right? <laughs> all the business and all the, we feel so good when we leave the chair. Like we told you everything and left it there. Exactly. <laughs> so when we had these conversations, we'd be talking about movies and television and music so music is always in the background you know in the shop you're playing something so when a client would leave the shop they would tell me hey what song was i playing i'm gonna go buy it because this is way before uh spotify and all that came out this was in the, like the 90s so i would say hey it was you know luther vandross or whitney houston and they go buy it and then a lot of times we discuss movies and films because I'm a real big movie buff. So I would go to the movies and I would tell the clients about it and they would go see the movie. They would even call me if they didn't have an appointment just to ask me what movie to see, you know? <laughs> you so, got all the bootlegs in the office, in the, in the salon. So. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, I, so I noticed like, I said, wow, you know, I'm kind of helping the entertainment companies promote their projects kind of inadvertently. So I said, wait a minute, they should be probably giving me free CDs and free movie passes to give away. So I said one day, I'm going to send a proposal to these studios and let them know that this is a captive, receptive audience that has an insatiable appetite for entertainment. And I sent the proposal off. And I didn't let fear hold me back because at that point I could have said, wait a minute, they don't know who I am. I'm not connected or whatever, but I always look at fear as false evidence appearing real. So I didn't let that stop me. So I sent it off and guess what ISIS, probably within about 30 days, I started receiving free CDs <laughs> from the record label and advanced screening passes. <laughs> Wow, so you over here doing giveaways in the in the salon, whoever shows up on time, right? Exactly. Like, <laughs> if you're late, you just get the bootleg. I'll be like, oh, you can get the you don't get there. You can so, wait. Yeah. So so the cool thing was at that point, I was just excited to get free swag items and stuff. You know, I was like, wait a minute, they give me and I had like the stuff early. They would send it to me before it came out. So I was like pumping it up and hyping it up and getting everybody ready for the album, you know, to come out. So that was kind of like the birth of my company. And then I, I kind of use that as like the pilot program. I said, let me do this for a while. And then the next big idea was, you know what? There's thousands of shops all across the country. So all I need to do is build up that network and get me some teams 
and I can do this all over the country. So I went back again to the same um, movie studios and entertainment company. And I said, guess what I could do for you? I can get your materials out in shop nationwide. And that was the birth of the company. Now I have a network of over 100,000 barbershops, salons, and nail shops nationwide. Wow, that is amazing. So you said, look, not only can I make my money doing the hair, I'm going to market myself and help other brands market themselves to get some coin and some dollar. I think that's really big when we're when we start talking about how much money and power we have as black folks in the in community in general. And then also just our spending power in black beauty. We spend, what, 500 billion? If you count in everything that we purchase across the you know globe with hair weaves and tools and everything like that, so mm -hmm. how do you then help? Like you've tapped into this market, but you also say that you're helping other brands expand their influence. How do you do that? Yeah, well, one thing I do is I in the community I help the the barber shops and these mm -hmm. salons. They're like the cartilage that holds the community's joints together. They're the coronary artery of the community. They're the ecosystem that makes the black community flourish. <laughs> so they are the innovators and the trailblazers and the, and the gatekeepers. And what they say, they have a lot of trust. So these shops kind of become trendsetters when they adopt some of the activations that I do. So that helps their businesses to grow because they're the they're that shop in that community that has the cool stuff. Empire just came out. So they came, they got the t-shirts, they got the nail files. We even do like big shop takeovers where uh, there was a show called Claws on TNT. Mm -hmm. And what we did is we did a takeover where we we'd screen, advanced screen the show in the shops with food and beverages and prizes. So imagine everybody, 100 people, 30 people coming to the shop and watching this show. So that really empowers them and opens the door for other things. And then I end up helping a lot of these owners with their business infrastructure and allowing them to know that there's more than be beyond the chair, beyond the salon. Hmm. What do you see is, has, has been the biggest challenge for them? And even for yourself, when you first got started into saying like, hey, I'm a business, how do I increase my revenue stream outside of just doing hair? Well, I think this is it right here. You have to develop a niche. You have to tap into your uniqueness. You have to find out what the DNA of your company, of your brand is. And that's when you will start to see the dividends pay off because you know what? Unique is better than better is. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's, that's what's up though. Like what I had a former mentor that would say there's riches and niches. Exactly. And also it's about positioning yourself because if you don't position yourself, I says you're going to get positioned. <laughs> <laughs> so explain that to, to our audience. What does that mean to position yourself? To position yourself means that you have to carve out your lane in what you do. Like if you're a, you want to be more of a specialist than a generalist in whatever you do because that's what brings out your superpower of, of what you do and your uniqueness in your lane. And that helps you to become the choice instead of just a choice. Add that. <laughs> Let that. <laughs> Say that again. That helps you become. That helps you become the choice instead of just a choice. So this for salon owners, for hairstylists, heck, if you do makeup, this is someone coming to you specifically for like a shortcut versus any cut. You become the, the master of the, the install. You become the master of a quick weave or, or a fade up or a color. You become known for that. And then you can raise your prices too. Exactly. <laughs> and, and, and not only the prices, you raise the bar. You you want to be the person that changes the game. You want to be that person that comes in and everybody says, man, um, when someone walks down the street or they see that's a signature cut, they say, oh, I know ISIS did that. 
you know, who did who did that cut, you know, on you. So, you know, you got to change the game and you got to, you know, kind of sometimes throw out the old playbook and become more nimble and become more agile, especially today. We've gone from brick and mortar to click and order during the pandemic. <laughs> For sure. Like we, and so there has to be a reason why we're going to get up and come into your salon, especially with YouTube tutorials that have people thinking they can do it themselves. It's a lie, but <laughs> it is. And you can't live out that lie. I mean, you know, you're going to, you get nowhere until you get real. <laughs> anyway. mm. Wow. So that, look, I love that piece right there about, you know, become the choice instead of a choice. I think that's something that most brands need to, to figure out and, and start looking at what are people coming to you for? Mm -hmm. What are people asking you for? And then and really focus on that. And so I want to know what are people coming to you for now? Well, people are coming to me for like multiple reasons. I have brands. I have um agencies that are coming to me to understand how to market to the African-American consumer in a culturally relevant way that resonates with that consumer. They come to me to understand, you know, how to connect with them, um, how to create the, the right depictions of them in their commercials, um, how to invest in the community. And how to understand that you don't just show up during Black History Month. It's, it's all year long. You know, I ask these brands and these companies, is your solidarity solid or is it symbolic? You know, does your stance line up with your stats? And this is what I tell them. The African-American consumer is now looking under the hood and holding you accountable. They're doing a 150 point inspection on your company. They're doing a CT scan on you. <laughs> <laughs> we are. We're going through the Instagram. We're looking on your website. Who owns this? Twitter. Black Twitter done found you a quote from 20 years ago. <laughs> no, and then, then what happens? You get the black lash on Black Twitter. <laughs> <laughs> so how has that conversation changed for you working with these brands over, you know, the past year and a half with the pandemic? And, you know, there was this whole push, you know, pull up or shut up. And then I hear folks saying that it's kind of dying back down again. Where where are you seeing um, their their interest and their focus being? Well, right now I see the everybody's foot is still on the gas. <clears throat> it may look like on the outside that things are dying down, but they're not. Um, you just had those the voter restrictions in Georgia, and look what happened. The corporations had to stand up again, whether they wanted to or not, because they know that that that's uh, injustice and and people got highly adjusted to the injustice around mm -hmm. here <laughs> so um what i see is when i talk to these brands when i talk to consumers they're very open to what i have to say they're very understanding because they know that the black consumer is voting with a 1.4 trillion dollar buying power that they have and that's what they fear most wow that's deep. And yeah, it went from 1.3 to 1.4. It's, it's edging up there. Every year is growing just a little bit more. Our dollars have power. And when you're talking about our dollars having power, how do you communicate that to brand, to the salon owners, to the barber shops who don't understand their power? Well, most people give up their power by not believing they have any in the first place. Mm -hmm. So when I talk to... Uh, owners of shops and small businesses, first I tell them good enough is not good enough anymore. Mm. You know, and I tell them that, you know, before COVID happened, it was like, you, you got to become ambidextrous again, because it was like people were cutting hair and doing braids with one hand behind their back. People got complacent. So what happened when COVID showed up, it not only showed us that we weren't prepared, it, when we were exposed to COVID, but COVID exposed the deficits that we had in our businesses and in our lives. And it was time to change the game. So through that adversity, you know, adversity usually introduces a person to themselves. And COVID was like that gymnasium of adversity for us to work out those problems that we never wanted to deal with. And it was that discomfort 
you know, the on, the more that you live in discomfort, the more you grow. And we can't live with this complacency. So that's what I was telling them. Look for the opportunities in the crisis. Restructure your business now while you have the time. Because before you said you didn't have the time. Now you have plenty of time to do it. You got nothing but time. What? How many, um, in terms of percentage, what percentage of, of salons or barbershops do you think were able to pivot in a way that kept them successful or at least afloat? during the pandemic by taking your advice? Just from my insight, I would say at least conservatively 35%. Mm. And, and what I was telling them was that, look, be concerned, but don't be consumed. We were all in the same valley of suffering. The sand was shifting underneath all of us and the economy was in an induced coma. So you have to balance the human need against the business need. Okay, okay. And we're talking marketing, right? Mm -hmm. and, and the work that you do. And this is something that I, I, I try to explain often to our audience. You know, I do PR and PR is getting you placements. It's getting you featured in a magazine and marketing is helping you take that feature or whatever you do with your business and increasing your revenue with it. And so that's what you're doing with your brands. How or the salons and I keep saying brands, it's not the, the big word here. So, but salons and barbershops, how do you then um, connect them in a way that helps them level up with their marketing efforts to increase their revenue? Is it like, can you kind of walk us through some of those other activations outside of, because right now we can't do like the in salons. In you know? Yeah. So, okay. Coming to America just came out and I spearheaded that activation and for Amazon, I collaborated with them as a consultant and I spearheaded that and we did a heavy social media campaign. You know, a lot of these uh, barbers and stylists have 200, 300,000 followers, you know, so it was significant for them to connect their brand with the coming to America uh, brand and because it had the same audience. So what that did is that gave them a lot more visibility because they were able to tie in. It's almost like when you see a McDonald's partnership with a movie, you're, you're literally partnering with that film or that project and you're putting it on social. So that just raises your level of visibility and, and everything else about your brand connecting with something like that. So that really helped a lot of those businesses when we did the social media campaign. And I kind of walked them through how that was a possibility for them. And they just had to really believe it. I think people, I think it's about not having possibility blindness <clears throat> because what happens ISIS is a lot of people limit their beliefs and you can never rise above your thoughts. So sometimes it's not even about the technique you use, it's what you believe about that techniques that enables you to reach your potential. Mm -hmm. that, that's amazing right there. Like, look, if you can see it and believe it, then you can be it, y'all. <laughs> that's it right there. If you can see it and believe it, you can be it. Um, and so what are some things that we have to see and believe in ourselves as salon, well, not myself, but in general as salon owners, barbershop, um, any, any beauty brand in terms of reaching out to you, what things do they have to have in place in order for it to be a good fit for you to help them level up their marketing? Besides 200,000 followers, do they have yeah, that? Exactly. Money? Yeah. Um, <laughs> I think that first of all, I think that you need to understand what your business is, mm -hmm. what your target audience is, you know, who your target consumer is. Um, I think you need to have a good understanding of um, your community and how <laughs> I'll, talk, I'll call this thing the immunity in the community <laughs> that we're able to get. And it's that personalized service that you give. I think those shops that really have that good service and understand um, that they need to cater to that consumer and offer even different services than they used to do than they used to have i think those are the businesses that are poised to take off and that i can really help elevate because if we can work from that baseline 
I think um, is the unlimited potential for you. Mm, okay. So it's really making sure that your brand of your salon is shaped, including yeah. like your core service. Do you have to have materials? Because, you know, nowadays you'll go on sites and all they have is their Instagram. They may not have a website. They may not have a logo. Those I things. Think, what do they need? Yeah. Well, you know, <laughs> you know it, like I say, it's a different. You have to raise the bar and keep raising the bar. Once you raise it, you raise it again and you raise it again. Mm -hmm. So you have to look around you. Look at your competitors. Look at who's doing good work. You know, look at who's having the quality, because think about it. The quality of your decisions determines the quality of your life and your business. <laughs> so so think about the quality <laughs> that that you and the and the value that you want to add to the community, to your clients and to the culture, because think about it this way. We don't just shape hair. We shape the culture one style at a time. Hmm. Hmm. Say that again. We shape the culture. We shape the culture one step. And not only that, you know, black salons and, and black shops, they're outsized influencers. They redefine the culture. They have to see themselves that way. And you know what they're doing? They're redefining the new cultural norms that's happening right now. Mm -hmm. So who would then what? So why would I reach out to you? Like, what would I be looking for specifically if I'm like, OK, I saw Will. And he's talking good stuff about how the black buying power and our dollar and influence. Um, what do I need to know to reach out to you for? Or do I just kind of wait for you to find me? How does that go? Well, you know, I'm, I'm all over Instagram. Uh, you can always DM me. Uh, you can go to my website. But it's really if you're thinking about wanting to drive a better business outcome mm -hmm. and drive your business forward, and really um, scale up your um, your marketing, your PR, learn how to put together a media kit. <laughs> Me and you know what that is. Right? Um, be, be, ready, be ready for the press. You want to be that shop owner or stylist that's ready when, they, when your local news wants someone to come on and show the new Christmas hairstyles or the holiday hairstyles. You want to be mm -hmm. ready for that, you know? So, um, if if you're ready, you know, to go to the next level and not be complacent anymore and really just hone in on your potential, hey, just you can reach out. Um, and if you want to be put on the list for different activations, because we're always adding new shops in different markets and different cities, mm -hmm. you can reach out for that, too. OK. OK. So, folks, if you're watching right now, please take notes. Follow uh, Will Shelton, CEO, founder of Willpower Integrated Marketing at I Am Willpower and, Will, and check out his website at willpowermarketing.com. And again, if you've just tuned in, we're talking to someone who has 25 years expertise plus um, as a licensed cosmetologist moved into marketing and helping push the vision, mission and capital of black owned salons, barbershops um, forward. That means more money, y'all. At the end of the day, more money, more exposure, more <laughs> and, and using your power of influence. And these are really big in conversations that we need to see more of in our salons and our barbershops who tend to have Instagrams, but don't have booking set up, who tend to have, you know, Facebook pages, but we can't hit find their website and don't have the e-commerce. And we want to make sure that we are getting the full picture. Right. Um. And then, Will, you do so much more outside of just talking to barbershops and salons. You are making the rounds right now. Talking <laughs> to myself, you know, I'm, I'm lower on this totem pole right now. But I've seen you all over just having these conversations on how we elevate. And you've got a book about it. So can you tell me some more about what you're looking and tapping into on your own potential? right? Yeah. Now? You know what? <clears throat> I tell people all the time that you want to live full and die empty. You want to live a life that outlives you. I told somebody the other day, when I die, life don't owe me no change because I spent it all. So <laughs> that that I don't want to get too deep, but that's where I'm going to have a book coming out. And the title is The Silent Agreement, because we all make silent agreements in our lives. And it's about the illusion of inclusion, how black executives can fight 
against the broken promises in the broken culture in corporate America. And it's based on boxing analysis. I'm a really big boxing fan and historian. So the, the uh, just to give you a little bit about the book, it starts off in the 1980s when Mike Tyson was champion. He used to knock out most of his sparring partners, but every once in a while he would get one he could knock out. Then he would resort to holding and clinching. His trainer told him one day, Mike, you got to stop making a silent agreement because one day you're going to get a guy who's not going to sign the contract. And guess what? In corporate America, when black executives get into that world, so they usually find out the hard way that the other side won't sign the contract. And you know what happens, ISIS? They don't stop fighting for those C-suite positions. They start fighting with less intensity. They start throwing don't hit me punches. And they start fighting not to lose instead of fighting to win, just waiting for the conflict to be over because they feel like their hopes and their dreams have been shoplifted. Ooh. And they end up turning into psychological contortionists for the illusion of inclusion. Y'all. <laughs> Y'all hear Will right now? <laughs> he done broke down the psyche of what it means to be a black person trying to get a seat at the table. Yep. That's literally what you just broke down. Yep. At the end, we're fighting for this illusion of inclusion. Yes. So Go ahead, Isis. And Isis, the, the bottom line of it is this. This can sum up the whole book. We may not get everything we fight for, but everything we get will be a fight. Oh. So does this book help us in how we fight because we get to the table and a lot of folks don't know how to fight or we come throwing bows but they not landed anywhere this gives you strategies this tells you how to become a champion how to fight toe to toe when you have to how to not throw in the towel and how to throw in the towel the right way because sometimes your corner man is his job to right protect. when he's getting good into <laughs> It's his job to protect you <laughs> to throw in the towel from throwing in the towel. And sometimes, you know what? This is what happens. I says a lot of times as black children, our parents tell us you have to do twice as much to get half the rewards as your counterparts. Right. So there's a chapter called fighting above your weight class, punching okay. above your weight class and never punch down. Because once you start punching down, the only way you go is down. Mm. All I hear in the back of my head is all my life I had to fight. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> oh, Oprah, come on. All my life I had to fight. So does this is this a book that works for folks in the beauty industry? It'll work for anybody. This okay. book will work for your marriage, for your business. Look, we make silent agreements in our own lives. Sometimes we have to look in the mirror and say, man, I let myself off the hook. Why did I let myself off the hook today? You know, it's it's a silent agreement that everybody makes in different areas of your life, not only in business, but in, in multiple areas. So, yeah, you can take this book, use those same strategies and personalize those strategies beyond the boardroom, the schoolroom, the courtroom and every room in your house. You know? OK, OK, OK. So, folks who are just tuning in, we are speaking with Will Shelton of Willpower Integrated Marketing. He has just dropped some some serious gems on his new book that's coming out Juneteenth, right? Yes. June, June. 19th, um, called The Silent Agreement. It's pretty much how to get a seat at the table, y'all, yeah. and how to fight for it. So that's, <laughs> that's <laughs> look, because we come in and swing it. Just be prepared to throw them bows. Um, if you have any questions for him, he is a marketing guru expert, 27 years um, as a licensed cosmetologist. He has created a network of 100,000 uh, black owned salons, barbershop. I'm telling y'all, we have, you know, we have intellectual magic right here, right now. And so if you've got questions, please drop them for him because I'm going to ask some more. <laughs> but if there's anything that you want, oh, look, Natasha said, look, the psychological contortionist. She held on to that one. He's oh. coming here like, let me twist you around real quick. Oh. <laughs> yeah. You know, it, it, it is that because there's, it becomes that because there's a truancy mm -hmm. of transparency in corporate America. In corporate America, 
you know, by confessing to this truancy, they can help heal the cultural damage. Mm. Oh, so we got work to do. Uh, you know, in our power, we have work to do to reclaim and, and hold on to that power. I think that's important for us to really, really process as we think about it being another fight, right? Um, exactly. And yeah. then your world, I know we talked a little bit pre, you know, start of this conversation that you've been all over when we're talking about how you're integrated with your marketing, right? In the world of beauty. <laughs> Way back, you said, you know, not only did you have a salon, you also worked with Hype Hair, my, I want to say alma mater, my former employer as well. Mm -hmm. um, what kind of work did you do in the beauty realm before you got into marketing outside? Wow. Of the well, it's kind of cool, kind of a cool story because way back, um, I became a photojournalist and photographer and I never went to school for it. One day I was at an event <clears throat> and then somebody's camera broke down i had this old camera and i started taking pictures they told me hey you want to go to this event the first event i went to was why do fools fall in love starring lorenz tate holly berry lila rashawn so i went and took these pictures isis and i told them i said look i do hair i don't take pictures so if they don't come back okay don't <laughs> don't blame me right mm -hmm. so i took these pictures back i got them developed and they said, oh, man, we're going to use it. We're going to put him in our magazine. So I was like, you guys are just being nice. So this is what I did. I said, I'm really going to find out if if I'm good, because everybody who saw the picture said, how long have you been taking pictures? I said, I just started. And they said, no way. So I bought this book called How to Submit Photography to Magazines. So I told mm -hmm. myself, I'm going to send these out to all the big magazines. So I'm going to send them out to Hype Hair, Sophisticated Hair Magazine, Jet Magazine, Vibe Magazine. I send them out to all the magazines. Guess what? Probably in about two months, they emailed, they sent me a letter and said, we want to use your photos in these magazines. And we want to hire you on assignment to go and take pictures at the Grammy Awards, at the movie premieres and all that stuff. So I ended up you know, the main photographer for Interscope Records, for Capitol Records. I was on the set of Keisha Cole's first video with Kanye West. And John, <laughs> listen to this, Isis, John Legend shows up. Before he was John Legend, he didn't even have an album out. And he walked up to me and they said, this is John. I said, hey, what's up, John? What are you doing? And he said, I have an album coming out. And he sung a little bit of Ordinary People for me that day. And about two months later, he blew up. So <laughs> I mean, Isis, I'm around, I, I started taking pictures of Beyonce when she was 17 years old and Destiny's Child. Um, her main publicist would always bring them over to me on the red carpet, say, hey, take their pictures because I know you're going to get them in Vibe and Jet Magazine. And I was taking pictures of 50 Cent in the G unit in Olivia for a whole summer. I was like the house photographer for them. So I, I've been around so much stuff and really um, I, I'm just grateful to have integrated all of these different sources and resources and gifts and talents that I have. And um, just I, I draw on all of it now, you know, and, and, you know, I always went after my dreams as if my life depend on it because the life that I wanted did. Now, I want y'all to process. He said. I was today years old when I started doing photography, right? Said, I'm going to get a book to learn about it. And then I'm going to pitch myself because now that I've learned about it, let me position myself to get placements and to dream bigger, right? Because you're talking about that good enough isn't good enough anymore, which you said earlier. Mm -hmm. So th those were lessons right there that he taught us just now without having to teach us. And that's something that please, please hold on to that. And, you know, in our conversation, you know, we talked about so many different things. And I just love to know with all the work that you're doing across this spectrum of Black empowerment, economic empowerment and marketing, what mm -hmm. legacy do you want to leave behind? Um, I think I want to leave a legacy that I contributed to the Black culture in the black community <clears throat> into my family and that I always raise the bar and I never allow fear 
which is false evidence appearing real to hold me back. And I never limited my point of entry. Um, and I just allowed God to use me to the fullest potential that he could. And that I died emptied and li lived full. That's mm -hmm. the kind of legacy I want to leave behind. And we do have a, a question in the audience. Um, someone, uh, Lisa, who is from Kentucky. She's talking about she from Muhammad Ali's hometown. She loved that boxing analogy, right? And wow. so she wants to know, is there what advice do you have for the brands? So I know that there's this piece for the salon and the in the barber shops, but what about the hair care brands? Is any advice to help them break through the noise? Yeah, the cut through the clutter, right? Mm -hmm. So what I would say got a butter now. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so what I would say, um, you know, as a brand, you want to be have an authentic brand story. I think if you connect with the community, um, think about this. What if you decided you were going to offer scholarships for beauty and barber college? What about the brand loyalty then that can come about? What if you really invested in, in shops in the community, young people who want to open a shop or want to become an intern? Invest in the community and you'll create that brand loyalty, the brand story, the testimonies. And that's when you'll develop the trust of them and, and to elevate your brand and to scale it. Hmm. I hope that helped Lisa. That was a good, that was a good note right there to, to expand, think outside the box, not just focus on how you push the, the hair care product, but how you push your overall brand. Yeah, that that's good. That's good. Please take notes on that one. Um, Will, you do so much. I love it. I love it. I love it. Um, is there something that you want to talk about that I haven't asked you that's like, oh, we got to get on this topic right now? Like, what are we missing in the conversation about the business of Black Beauty? Hmm. I would. Uh, let me think about that for a second. I think we cover so much ground and so much real estate. Mm -hmm. uh, I think I think ultimately it probably comes back to being culturally relevant with, with the brand, um, understanding that the community needs and wants your presence there. I think that you brands need to make sure, you know, look that they have their products accessible in the communities. I think they need to start helping with healthcare initiatives because you can deal with hair care, but healthcare period is is tied into that too to me. I think that um brands just just really need to really take a deep dive to the end of the deep end of the pool with um with people and just understanding you know the consumer trends and you know creating something that's never been done before don't don't do the same traditional stuff that's how i've um been able to overcome obstacles is just trying to stay unique and trying to stay ahead of the game and be i think you want to be a brand and I think a small business should be a thought leader. Ultimately, you gotta you gotta stand for something. It's not good enough anymore just to sell butter. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's not, not not gonna work. Not in not in this day and age because mm -hmm. too many people, like I say, they're looking under the hood. They're they're checking your oil. <laughs> you know, they're checking your brake fluid, and if if you don't have what more uh, was behind the display than what you display in the front, then they're just going to vote with their dollars with another brand or create their own brand. Right. Because you have a lot of, well, I can do that too now. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And people are, are they're they're innovators now. They're, they have, look, you, this is what happened during COVID. We all were quarantined, but you can't quarantine hustle. And you can't show <laughs> creativity. <laughs> <laughs> you can't quarantine hustle. Look, you just dropping all the all the sound bites tonight. I love this. <laughs> you can't do it. We got to keep moving it and, and elevating our brands as we as we 
So what I'm hearing you say, right, is as we are pushing for other folks to recognize our black buying power and yep. to also spend their money with us on the marketing, we also have to understand our power. You have to, I think you really have to understand your power <clears throat> before you talk about anybody else's power. You have to understand that most people think is what they what they don't have, they think is what they need, but it's not really that. Um, it's they're held back by believing that they're not enough. And you know, you have to believe, Isis, that you can win with what you have and that you're enough. And if you can see that, then you can, that can be the platform that you jump off of. Even if you have to borrow the confidence of somebody else to your own confidence kicks in, that's what you have to do. <laughs> Ooh. <laughs> Come on, girl, let me borrow some of this. I need some of that, like that same body love that you got. I need some of that for my own confidence. No, that's real. Just scroll through Instagram for about five minutes and get, and just take some of that confidence. <laughs> and swoop it up. Exactly. Oh, <laughs> and start to build yeah. your brand. Oh, this has been a great conversation. Well, I'm so glad I was able to to connect with you. <laughs> the book comes out, The Silent Agreement, that's got us all ready to fight up in arms. Um, mm -hmm. June, you said June 19th. June 19th. Yep. And how do we find that? Do we find that on Amazon? You can find that on it'll be on Amazon, Barnes and Nobles, all the online retailers. I even have a website. The silentagreement.com. You can go straight there and order okay. it off when it when it gets comes out. Mm -hmm. Okay. For folks, but they can also find it on the Willpower Marketing website yeah. as well. So this is so great. Thank you so much, Will, for your time and for this conversation. I, I look forward to learning more from you and for us to be able to share more of the work that you're doing with our readers and our audience because it is super important, super elevating, um, and just necessary. Yeah, mm -hmm. it's super necessary. Any last words? Yeah, I just think people should never let anybody try to convince them that they don't have enough or they can't do it because they don't know who you are. They know, have no idea who you are. So don't try to convince anybody, you know, because a person convinced against their will is of the same opinion still. You just keep working your plan. You keep working your dream because what you do speaks louder than what you say. Mm. Will show to everyone. Thank you so much. I'm Isis with the Business of Black Beauty. You have been amazing. Thank you. Thank you.